High up in the mountain of Wales, hidden by crag after crag and guarded by eagles, it is said there lies a secret city of Druid alchemists known as Dinas Afaraun, the Ambrosial City. Here the Ferald, as these alchemists are called, practice the Druid arts of magic, exploring the depths of the oceans, the heart of the earth, the civilizations of other ages and galaxies. They brew the cauldron of bright knowledge, three drops of which bring enlightenment to the worthy. They refine their philosophy and their arts in discussion and debate in towers of crystal that reach almost as high as the peaks of Snowdonia that surround them. The stories and songs of the bards warm their hearts by night. The herbs and oils of their healers, the ovates, bring them strength by day. They have found the grail, and here, in the innermost sanctuary of their city, it radiates its power and love throughout the world. Nearby lies the body of King Arthur, surrounded by his knights, asleep in a deathless dream, but ready to awaken if he is ever needed. Once, long ago, before the great battle of Camlan, at which King Arthur died, cut to the quick by his own son Mordred, once, long ago, when it was still early in Arthur's reign, and in the round table had just been established at Camelot, there lived a lord and lady in a great castle by Lake Bala. The lady was none other than the goddess Caridwen, queen of the harvest and of the sickle moon. Despite her beauty and her powers, there were those who denied she was a goddess. Caridwen's just a witch, they would say, their voices betraying their fear of a woman who could shapeshift into raven or fawn in the blinking of an eye. With her flowing red hair, deep blue eyes, and fine broad shoulders, she inspired awe and devotion in some, fear and loathing in others. Her husband, Lloyd, Lord Tegid, was hardly ever at her side. For months he would be away from the castle, hunting or crowsing with the other petty barons of this wild and windswept land. Of their two children, he treasured his daughter, Creui, but he could hardly bear to look at their son, Morfran, Sea Raven or Grey Crow, whom they sometimes called Evagdu, utter darkness, so repulsive was his face. Determined that if her son could not be handsome, then at least he could be inspired and illumined, Caridwen made the journey to Dinas Afaram to discover from the Pharaoh themselves the formula for the creation of Awen. The Awen, the magical elixir of the Druids that would bring enlightenment and joy to whoever tasted but three of its drops. If a Vagdu could not be handsome, then at least he could be wise and at peace with the world. Caridwin left the children in the care of their nurse, who had been in the service of their family since a child. She traveled for days on her mare, White Foam, until at last, reaching the mountains of Snowdonia, she saw the crystal towers of the city of Ferald on the horizon, shining in the light of the setting sun. She rode swiftly onwards, reaching the city by nightfall. Pounding on the mighty iron doors of the city's outer wall, Caridwen expected them to be opened by an armed guard, but instead found herself greeted by a dark-haired woman with soft gray eyes who, swathed in a black shawl, led her without word to the heart of the city. There she met the inner council of the Feralt, both men and women of clear demeanor and calm bearing, who listened to her tale and agreed to her request. They asked the gatekeeper to lead Caridwen to the library in the central tower of the city. There, surrounded by ancient manuscripts, the librarian opened before her the first book of the Feralt. And there, on its pages of faded parchment, was written the formula for the creation of Alwyn. Once she had finished transcribing the formula, Caridwen was led by the gatekeeper to the city gates. <clears throat> Caridwen turned and looked deep into her eyes, 
before stepping through the gateway and mounting her horse to ride like a creature of the wind back to her castle beside Lake Bala. On her return, she rushed straight to the children's bedchamber. There, they both lay sleeping. Kreui, with her golden curls framing her sweet and delicate features, and Evagdu, with his misshapen face, tossing and turning in his sleep. Assured of the children's safety, she began at once the preparations for making the brew which would bring Alwyn to her son. The Book of the Feralds had told her that she must prepare a cauldron filled with fresh water into which she must strew herbs and roots gathered at special times of the day and night, at sunrise for some plants, at sunset for others, at the dark of the moon for some roots, at the full moon for the rest. All were to be boiled for a year and a day within the great iron cauldron. Then out of the steaming brew would fly three drops of the druid elixir, three drops of bright knowledge that would bring wit and wisdom and all knowledge to whoever tasted them. Caradwin left the castle and walked in the moonlight to the lake shore. There to the west, she could see the peaks of Caer Emrys rising steeply out of the water. The sky was filled with a thousand stars and the waxing moon had almost reached its zenith in the sky. The dark slopes of the mountain curved around the lake as if protecting the still black waters that lapped gently against the rocks along the shore. Caradwin stretched her arms out to the lake and began to lift them up gently to the moon. She did this nine times, and each time she lifted them up, she could feel a lifting, pulling energy coming from her womb and from the lake at the same time. And she chanted softly, out of the womb, out of the boundless to the world of time, out from the deep, I ask you to come, O vision of mine, desire of mine, yearning of mine. And as she called to the deep, to the unknown, to the mother, she pictured her son emerging from the lake, radiant with light, knowing all things, the finest poet, the most accomplished bard of Merlin's Isle. The magic done, she hurried to the blacksmith Govanan. There in his forge, built on the side of the mountain, Govanan drew on the powers of earth, fire, air, and water to craft the weapons and wheels of Lord Tagid and his allies. A druid of many years training, he could call on the dragons of Beli to fly from Dennis Afaram to his mountainside forge, there to work at firing the ore with their flaming breath, as eagerly as wolves might devour a carcass. I need a cauldron wide and deep, said Caradwin, handing Govanan a bag of silver coins to pay for his work, while telling him to deliver the cauldron to the empty fisherman's cottage by the lakeside. To tend the fire beneath the cauldron for a year and a day, Caradwin needed servants, and as if by chance she happened upon an old blind man wandering through the forest beside the castle, led by, the, by a young boy. The blind man recognized Caradwin at once, confusing her not for witch or mortal, but knowing in the certainty of his heart that she was the white goddess of the moon and the harvest blade. His name was Morda, Sea Father, and he had lived in the forest for years, eking out a meager living as a charcoal burner. In his right hand, he held a stick to steady his frail and aged body. And with his left hand, he had let himself be guided by Guillaum Bach, little innocent, who came from Kerrienan in Powys. Caradwin engaged both young and old men at once to chop and stockpile wood for the fire that would heat the cauldron and to tend to the brew as it cooked through the seasons. Several days passed until at last Govanan arrived at the cottage late at night with the newly fashioned cauldron. 
Cairdran awoke Morda and Gwion at once and ordered them to prepare the fire. Then she hurried to the lake to draw water, pausing a moment to gaze at the moon. Returning to the cottage, she warned Gwion and Morda for the ninth time never to taste the brew they would tend. Remember, the feral had told her, that the first three drops bring the bright knowledge that you seek for your son, but that the rest of the brew brings only baleful knowledge and misery to all it touches. Make sure it is only your son who tastes those first three drops, and then allow the rest of the mixture to boil away to nothing before the cauldron is smelted down. As she filled the cauldron with lake water and added the herbs and roots, she chanted the spells given to her by the wise ones of Denis Aferam. Then she returned to her castle. For a year, Morda and Guion gathered firewood and tended the cauldron, ensuring that the mixture never boiled over and that fresh water was added whenever needed. They passed the time talking of their lives, telling each other stories, and playing Guith Buith, an ancient form of chess. The year passed slowly. Summer changed to autumn, and then winter came with a suddenness that surprised even Morda, who had survived 70 winters in this harsh and rugged land. Waiting for the cold days to pass, Morda and Guion sat closer to the fire, warming their hands in its glow, toasting food on sticks they thrust into its flames. But as day follows night, spring came close on the heels of winter, and before long it was summer again. A year had passed. And with only one day before Ivagdu was due to receive the three sacred drops, Cairdwin and her hapless son returned to the cottage, greeting Morda and Guion briefly before seating themselves beside the cauldron. As midnight approached, they both fell asleep. Morda sensed the fire dying down and ordered Guion to toss more logs beneath the cauldron. As he did so, the mixture spluttered and boiled over. Three drops flew on to Guion's thumb, scalding it and without a thought, he sucked them from his burning skin. In that instance, the cauldron seemed to shriek as if in pain. There was a great cracking, splitting sound, and it burst in two, releasing the remains of its brew, which ran now from the house to Lake Bala, poisoning it and the surrounding land. The grass turned black as if scorched by fire, and the horses of Garan here, that grazed beside the lake would lie dead by morning. But in that instance, Guion knew everything. He knew that in a second, Cairdwin would awake and that in her fury, she would seek to kill him. He ran from the cottage and within a moment, Cairdwin did indeed awake and seeing what had happened, struck Morda across the face. She ran from the cottage screaming with the rage that sent shudders down Guion's spine. Within minutes, Cairdwin had run so fast after Guion that she was within inches of seizing him by the throat. She stretched out her arms as she ran, and just as her long fingernails began to press into the flesh of his neck, he discovered that he could change himself into any creature he wished. And so, with just a thought, he transformed himself into a hare. Darting from Cairdwin's grasp, he soon had the advantage, leaping over ditch and through hedge, but Cairdwin was not to be outwitted. With the power of the goddess of the changing moon, she turned herself at once into a black greyhound bitch, and the chase continued. Plunging through hedgerow and over ditches, she had soon gained the ground she had lost. There within inches of her was the hare. She rushed forward with snarling mouth to seize it by the throat. But as the dog's sharp teeth were about to sink into the terrified creature, both animals found themselves rushing headlong into a fast flowing stream. Guion, now possessed of all knowledge, 
knew that he must transform himself into a salmon, and within seconds he was downstream, feeling the cool water on his body as he swum swiftly towards the ocean. But Cairdwin, within seconds too, had transformed herself into an otter and continued to relentlessly pursue her quarry. And just as her otter's claws reached for Guion's silver skin, he changed into a bird, lifting his body out of the water and high into the air. But in a moment, she turned herself into a hawk and was soon soaring high above poor Guion, ready to pounce, when he, spying a pile of winnowed grain, decided that he would become a grain of wheat. Surely he would never, she would never find him there. Plummeting down from the sky, he turned himself into one tiny wheat seed just at his, as his bird body hit the soft pile of grain. Cairdwin flew to the ground and with icy determination, skin changed once more into the form of a large black red crested hen. With uncanny precision, her beak thrust its way into the pile and picked and swallowed the one grain among thousands that was Guion Bach. Contented, Cairdwin returned home, but the seed quickened inside her. Guion had become a babe once more, and for nine months he grew inside the womb of the goddess who had tried to destroy him. When the time came for her to give birth, Cairdwin was determined to kill Guion, who had so cunningly managed to avoid death in this way. But when the baby was born, the child was so fair and beautiful, she could not find it in her heart to kill it. She held the fair child in her arms and suckled it a while and then placed it in a bag of leather, which she sewed closed and cast into the sea. For nine months, the bag floated on the water. For nine months, Guion sat within the darkness, journeying with his soul between this world and the next, finding secrets, learning songs. For nine months, he was held in the womb of the ocean, feeling the love of the moon goddess in the ebb and flow of the tide, feeling the power of the sky god in the breath and fury of the wind. And all the while, he journeyed in the leathern bag towards his future, towards his foster father, Elfin, who also was traveling to meet his destiny to meet the foster child he would soon find, caught in the salmon wear of his father, Lord Garanhir. Garanhir had wanted to help his son Elfin, who had experienced nothing but bad luck throughout his life. So he had told him to go down to the weir that he owned on the shores of the river Conwy, to take as many salmon as he could on the eve of Beltane, the first of May. Gron here used to go himself and always found a good catch of salmon there, caught in the nets his servants had slung across the weir. As the fish made their way to their spawning grounds upstream, they found themselves meeting, not the old stream beds of their birth, but the fatal mesh of his wide nets. At least, thought Gron here, Elfin can earn himself a princely sum with the sale of these fish and a trium triumphant return home to a Beltane feast of celebration. But when Elfin arrived at the weir with the servants, they found not a single salmon, confirming his fear that he was indeed born to be unlucky, Elfin began to lament his fate until out of the corner of his eye, he noticed a leather bag caught on one of the poles that held the nets. Elfin lifted the bag out of the water, raised his dagger to it, and slid it open. In wonder, he gazed at the baby before him. Turning to his, his, turning to his servants, he exclaimed, Behold, a radiant brow, Taliesin. And the baby boy within the bag sat up and smiled, gazed directly into Elfin's eyes, saying, Taliesin it is. Elfin carried the boy home to his wife. They cared for him as if he were their own. And with each year that he grew, his wisdom grew tenfold, so that when he was but 13, 
he was the greatest and wisest poet in the land. And when Taliesin was of th this age, his foster father, Elfin, traveled to the court of King Malgun. There he told the king that Taliesin was the finest bard of all. But instead of being delighted, the king was outraged, taking such a claim as a slight against the 24 bards of his royal court. In fury, he threw Elfin into his deepest dungeon. With his inner vision, Taliesin saw this injustice and traveled at once to the court, reassuring his foster mother before leaving that I, Taliesin, chief of bards, with the wise druid's words, will set Elfin free. He arrived at the court, rendered all of the king's bards dumbfounded with a magic spell, and told the king, primary chief bard am I to Elfin, and my original country is the region of the summer stars. He then caused a mighty storm to howl around the king's castle until the king repented and released Elfin from prison, accepting Taliesin as the wisest of all bards. Even the great Druid Merlin once said, since I, Merlin, am second only to Taliesin, let my words be heard as truth. And for this reason, some say that the secret name of the Isle of Merlin is Taliesin's Isle, the Isle of poets and dreamers and seekers of wisdom. I love this story. There are over uh, two dozen early manuscript versions of this story. Um, they're all different. Uh, this one here is contemporary from the order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids, which I'm a member of. Um, there's narratives, there are clues in the narrative that kind of hints that this story originates in the Bronze Age. It's a great story of initiation and transformation. I wouldn't be surprised if in some other versions, Vagdu is described as dark haired uh, in comparison to his beautiful sister, Kuri, who has golden hair. Remember uh, his name, uh, uh, means Ivagdu means utter darkness. His other name, Morfran, uh, means sea raven or great crow. So, you know, you have darkness there, black. So, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if he was ever described as having dark hair just for that reason there. But also, you know, you, you think of holy people illuminated people, um, kings and, and queens, which are divinely anointed with their golden crowns. And what all these people have in common is that golden halo around their head. So with Kariri, she's golden haired. So that suggests that she's illuminated where Vagdu is not. And you think about it, Guion, um, in the story, he's not, like his physical appearance isn't described, but I would think that he would never be described as golden haired when he's reborn as Taliesin, he is golden haired. So he has that halo of light around his head. So he goes from being Guion uh, unilluminated to Taliesin illuminated again with that radiant light, that golden hair around his head. And of course, with Vagdu not being illuminated, his mother, Caridwin, has to resort to an alchemical process and that's the brew boiling in the cauldron 
the alchemical potion that Vegdu is meant to drink, which Guion ends up uh, drinking the three drops and he in turn becomes illuminated. And at that moment, when the chase begins, Cairdwin becomes the initiator. And I think it's pretty obvious in the story that that chase where Guion is transforming into different animals, it, I think it's very obvious that that is um, an elemental process. Um, again, Cairdwin as initiator, um, basically sending him along through his alchemical process, through the elements as part of his initial transformation. When he transforms into the grain and is consumed by Cairdwin, um, she becomes impregnated with him and that's his nine month gestation process between the beginning of his alchemical process through the elements to his rebirth as an illuminated person. And even after he's born, he again goes through another nine month process sewn up in the leather bag in the sea, learning new things. So that nine month gestation process from being unilluminated, but alchemically transformed through the elements doesn't end with his rebirth. He still has that nine month period of learning new songs, new stories, new words, and becomes the greatest of all bards. Taliesin, meaning shining brow. That light, that glow from his brow. I would assume his uh, pineal gland, which is long believed to be the place of psychic awareness and perception. And of course, again, golden haired. So he has that halo of light surrounding his head. He's illuminated. He has all in inspiration. Um, he's transformed, connected with his higher self and through his higher self through to the divine, whether you see that as God or goddess or the gods. So it's a fascinating story of initiation, alchemical transformation. And this story um, really was my, I don't want to say blueprint, but my inspirational story through my process, through my Druid training. So um, this tale um, is very close to my heart. So I hope you enjoyed that reading and um, don't make fun of my Welsh because, <laughs> because I'm not fluent in Welsh. And, uh, but yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>